Section 5.1, Sequences. This is from OpenStax Calculus Volume 2. At the bottom of every page is a link to where you can download the full textbook. So please do that. Um, this is only to, to aid you as you go through that book, hopefully. Okay, so to begin with, a sequence is an infinite ordered list of numbers of the form a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to n, and just continuing on. Now, each of these numbers is called a term. Okay, each of these is a term. And the symbol n is used as the index, okay, it's the index variable for the sequence. We often write in these curly braces a sub n from n equals 1 to infinity to denote that sequence. Now, one thing to notice is this is a function, really. It's a function with a domain of 1, 2, 3, the natural numbers, okay? That's all it is, is a function, but its domain is restricted to the natural numbers. So, for instance, let's consider the sequence right here. We have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. You can write that as 2 to the n, okay, the sequence embraces there. So that has two ways, two forms we could write. We say a, a sub n equals 2 to the n, or a sub n equals 2 times a sub n minus 1. That is a recursive form where it means we take the current term is 2 times the previous term. Okay, so we are multiplying by 2 each time so that um, that follows through. So let's go ahead and look at a sequence here, 3, 7, 11, 15, 19. Write an explicit formula for this sequence. All right, so to begin, a n equals, okay, our first term is 3, and it appears that it is increasing by 4 each time. So this is plus 4 times n minus 1. That is, plug the value of 1 in there. Plug for n equal to 1, that would be 3, which is our first term. Plug in a value of 2. That would be eight, or that would be uh, one times four, so that is seven. Um, so that takes the minus n minus one takes into account the fact that we're starting at one. Now, if we rearrange that, that would be four n plus uh, minus one. Four n minus one is the explicit formula for that. Okay, number two. Consider two negative two thirds, two ninths, negative two set twenty sevenths, two eighty firsts. Write an explicit form. Okay, so the first thing I notice is that I am starting with 2. Okay, so this is 2. Now, in this case, this is multiplying by 1 third, it appears, each time. It's multiplying by 1 third each time. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and put the n minus 1 there. Now, there's only one thing that does not account for. That does not account for the changing of positive to negative, positive to negative. So I'm going to go ahead and make this a negative one-third. And every time you write a formula like this, you want to take values of n and try that out and make sure that a sub 1 is in fact 2. If I plug in a value of 1, that is 2. Okay, if I plug in a value of 2, that is negative two-thirds. Okay, that's good. So it does in fact work for that. Right, next. Negative one-half, two-thirds, negative three-fourths, four-fifths, negative five-sixths. All right, so it appears that our numerator is always the n value. So this is a1, a2, a3, a4, a sub 5. So the numerator is always that n value. So let's go ahead and say yeah, that's n. And the denominator is always one more than that, so n plus 1. Okay, now, the alternating pattern we've got, where it goes positive, negative, positive, negative, I'm going to use a negative 1 to the n. Now let's check that. If I plug in a value of 1, that is going to be negative. Okay, negative 1 over 2. That works. If I plug in a value of 2, that is positive 2 thirds. Okay, so that does in fact fit our sequence. All right, next we have number 4. Example 4. Consider the sequence 3 fourths, 9 sevenths, 27 tenths, 81 thirteenths, 243 sixteenths, etc. We want to determine an explicit formula for this sequence. Well, there are a few things that I hope that you notice. One is that we have powers of 3. Now, let me just go ahead and notate this as a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, and a sub 5. So we want to relate those powers of 3, or whatever patterns we see, back to those subscripts so that we can say that a sub n is something. Well, it appears to me 
that since they're powers of three, it appears that we have three to the first. Right, so three fourths is three to the first over something there. Nine sevenths is three squared over something. Okay, so it appears that that matches up. The first term, the first term is three to the first. The second term is three to the second, etc. So three to the n. Now for the denominator, there's a sequence going on here. It's arithmetic. It begins at four, and it increases by it appears to be three each time. So this would be four plus three times something. So let's think about this. This would be four plus zero, so that should be to the n minus one, because that would be three times zero. Okay, that would match up. So I'd, I'd take one and I'd subtract one, that'd be zero. Okay, and this one should be, if it matches up, four plus three times two minus one. Yes, okay, that is lining up. And so we could check that with the rest of it, but that will be our explicit sequence. All right, next we have number five. One-fifth, negative one-seventh, one-ninth, negative one-eleventh. All right, so the denominators, I see a pattern. The numerators, they are just, the numerators are simply going between one to negative one, one to negative one. So let's do a negative one to the n. And if I plug in a value of one, that would be negative. Hmm, maybe I should make that an n minus one. Let's try that. If I plug in a value of n equals one, that is positive. That's, yeah, that's positive. If I plug in a value of two, that is negative. Okay, so it's altering back and forth properly. Now the denominator is five plus, and it is increasing by two, so two times n minus one. So let's write that as negative one to the n minus one over two n plus three. That is our explicit formula for that sequence. Okay, next we have some recursive sequences. Okay, let's begin with a. a1 equals 2, so the first term is 2, and each term is multiplying by negative 3, that appears, so that is 2, negative 6, 18, negative 54, so the way that we can write that is our first term, and then it's multiplying by negative 3, so that will be negative 3 to the n minus 1. Plugging in a value of 1, that is 2. Plugging in a value of 2, that is negative 6, because this, that holds. Okay, B, we have 1 half. This one's a little more complicated. Let me give it a little more space. Our first term is 1 half. Our second term is one-half plus one-half squared. We're adding one-half to, to that power next. And that is three-fourths. Okay, and then the next term, if we do one-half plus one-half, okay, we'll take that last term, three-fourths, plus one-half to cubed, that is gonna be seven-eighths. If we add in, so seven-eighths plus one half to the fourth power, that is going to be 15 out of 16. Okay, so in general, it looks to be we have one less than our denominator. One less than our denominator. So our denominator is powers of two, so that's two to the n minus one divided by two to the n. Written equivalently, that would be 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n. That is our explicit formula. All right, one more recursive. The first term is negative 4, and it appears to be adding 6 each time. So my sequence is negative 4, 2, 8, 14, etc. Alright, so a n is negative 4 plus 6 times n minus 1, or 6 n minus 10.
All right, next we have this idea of a limit of a sequence. Given a sequence a n, if the terms a n become arbitrarily close to a finite number l, as n becomes sufficiently large, we say that a n is a convergent sequence, and l is the limit of that sequence. Whoops, that is meant to be that. Okay, so it's the limit of the sequence. In this case, we write the limit as n, as n goes to infinity of a n equals l, or simply a n converges to l. If it does not converge, if it's not going in a direction, then it is a divergent sequence. Be familiar with those words there, convergent and divergent. All right, let's check out some examples here. All right, so he, these are graphed as the values of n are on the x-axis and the values of a n, the sequence values, are on the y-axis. As n increases, it appears for a that it is divergent. It is just going off to infinity. It's not heading any particular place. All right, b, b looks like it's actually approaching 1. As n increases, it is getting closer and closer and closer to 1. It's sort of leveling off there. Right, C is totally divergent. It is going back and forth between negative 1 to 1, negative 1 to 1, negative 1 to 1. It's not actually going anywhere. And the D there, it's approaching 0. These values are going positive and negative, but they're bouncing back and forth and getting closer to 0. So some examples. Now here is the formal definition of a convergent sequence. Okay, this should look very familiar. It should remind you of limits from Calculus 1. And that is the absolute value. So let's see, okay, let's start from the top. A sequence a n converges to a real number l if for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists an integer n such that the absolute value of a n minus l, previously that would have been f of x minus l, is less than epsilon if n is greater than capital N, greater than or equal to capital N. The number l is the limit and we write the limit as n goes to infinity of a n equals l, or a n converges to l. In the case that this is convergent, okay, if this l holds, this is a convergent sequence. If it does not converge, then it's a divergent sequence, and we say the limit does not exist. So the idea is that after a certain point, capital N, the values of the sequence are as close as we want, that is, epsilon, to the value l. That's how you can interpret that. After a certain point, the values are as close as we want to this certain value that we're calling the limit. All right, let's move on to the next thing. So now we already said that these are functions. Sequences are functions with a domain of the natural numbers. So that means that we can actually use some things from limits. Okay, the limit of a sequence defined by a function. If we can find a function that has the same values as our sequence, then we can just use our limit properties. So I'm going to, for each of these, consider whether it diverges or converges. And I'm going to redefine this. The limit as x goes to infinity of 5 minus 3 over x squared. If we have this function, then this second term will go to 0, and the limit is 5 which means that a n converges to 5. So I can take that function idea and then use something there and then backtrack to a limit. Okay, next, limit as x goes to infinity of 3x to the fourth minus 7x squared plus 5 over 6 minus 4x to the fourth. Now we can use L'Hopital's rule actually because this is continuous and these are both going to infinity. One's going to negative, one's going to positive infinity. Or we can use an idea we've used from calculus one that these terms are negligible. These terms don't change much. Oh, actually wrong one. These terms don't affect anything. So in the long run, all that we really care about is 3x to the fourth over negative 4x to the fourth, which is negative 3 fourths. So a n approaches negative 3 fourths in this case. Part C. All right, the limit as x goes to infinity of 2 to the x over n squared. 
Okay, both of these are going to infinity, so we are going to have to apply L'Hopital's rule here. This is an indeterminate form. As x goes to infinity, that is going to be the natural log of 2 times 2 to the x over 2n. Still both going to infinity. Oh, I changed to x's in one and n's in the other. Okay, so let's fix that real quick. Now, you can apply these properties with n's in there, okay, because they are a function defined in terms of n. Okay, now that does not help. So let's apply L'Hopital's rule again. X goes to infinity. This is the natural log of 4 times 2 to the x over 2, which then goes to infinity, which means we can write a n diverges, it goes towards infinity, and the sequence is divergent, or just simply the sequence diverges. For part D, we notice that this is actually of the form 0 to the infinity. As the inside portion is going to 1, okay, we have to the infinity. So we are going to have to modify this just a little bit. Let's first take the natural log. So we're still taking the limit of 1 plus 4 over n to the n. By taking the natural log, because the natural log is continuous, we can interchange these. So this is the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the natural log of 1 plus 4 over n. And actually, let's go ahead and change these to x. That way we can apply some of our familiar tactics to it, which treat this as if it's a function without that restricted domain of the natural numbers. So 4 over x to the x. x is going to infinity x goes to infinity, or x to the x. Now, a logarithmic property here will bring our x down. Now, what you're going to do is, this is still written in, in terms of infinity times 1, okay, or infinity times 0 because of the natural log there. So, we are going to rewrite this. x goes to infinity. Okay, let's rewrite this as this quotient. Natural log of 1 plus 4 over x over 1 over x. Now we are in the form 0 over 0, an indeterminate form, so we can apply L'Hopital's rule. Take the derivative of the denominator and the numerator. Taking the derivative of the numerator okay, is going to be negative 4 over x squared divided by 1 plus 4 over x because that is the derivative of the logarithm, that natural logarithm. All right. So once we put that there, we have a complex fraction. So divided by the derivative of 1 over x, which is negative 1 over x squared. Now rearranging that, this is the limit of 4 over 1 plus 4 over x. And the limit of that is 4. Now we can observe at this point that this says the natural log of our sequence is converging to 4. Again, the natural log is a continuous function, so we can actually go ahead and say that this means that a n, the sequence itself, is converging to e to the 4. And that is it. Okay, so now this technique of using logarithmic properties to get something in the form of L'Hopital's rule is very handy and it comes in useful lots of times. All right, now let's move on to our next part. Letter E. All right, so the limit as x goes to infinity of 5x squared plus 1 over e to the x. Both are going to infinity, so we can apply L'Hopital's rule. Limit as x goes to infinity of 10x over e to the x. The 
that does not help. So let's apply L'Hopital's rule again. It's going to be 10 over e to the x, which that limit is 0. So a n goes to 0. It converges to 0. Right, next, determine if each sequence diverges or converges. Well, because we have some continuous functions here, cosine is a continuous function, we can take the limit. If I take the limit, n goes to infinity of cosine of 3 over n squared. Applying my limit, this term goes to 0, which means this converges to cosine of 0 or 1. So a n converges to 1. The square root function is also continuous. So we can take the limit of the square root of 2n plus 1 over 3n plus 5. This limit is going to 2 thirds. So the limit, or just a n, converges to the square root of 2 thirds, which is the square root of 6 over 3 if you'd like it rationalized. So it converges to the square root of 6 over 3. Okay, determine if these converge or diverge. Okay, it's important to recall the squeeze theorem. We are going to be able to use that. So cosine is stuck between negative 1 and 1. Negative 1 and 1 cosine n over n squared. So that is between negative 1 over n squared and 1 over n squared. As both of these go to 0, s converges to 0 as well. All right, the squeeze theorem is helpful when you have something that is alternating as well because cosine goes from negative to positive, negative to positive. Well, the specific negative 1 half to the n, that is bounded between 1 over 2 to the n okay, and negative 1 over 2 to the n. In fact, it takes on those values in between as both of these are going to 0. Our sequence in the middle, a n, converges to 0 as well. Okay, we have a new concept to add here. The idea of something being bounded. Oh, one more. All right, so sine is bound. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and write this as that is 2 minus sine n over n. Over n. Okay, so sine n over n, that is bounded between negative 1 over n. So this is bounded between 2 minus 1 over n. Write that whole thing in there. 2 minus sine n over n, and 2 plus 1 over n. As both of these are going to 2, that means that our sequence a n converged to 2. Okay, next we have the idea of bounded sequences. A sequence is bounded above if there's a number such that the whole the sequence for every term is less than or equal to that number. Bounded below is the same idea. We have a number that's underneath every term. The sequence is a greater than all of those, than the number for every term. All right, a sequence is a bounded sequence if it's bounded above and below. Okay, if it's not bounded, we call it unbounded. Now, this is a very important fact, this next thing. We have that a sequence, if it converges, then it is bounded. However, just because something is bounded does not mean it, it con that it converges. Okay, so you can consider something like that, the alternating sequence, what that's called. It bounces between negative 1 and 1. It's bounded, but it never converges. It's divergent. All right, next, we have the idea of a monotone sequence. Something is increasing if each term, the next term, is always greater than the last term. It's decreasing if the terms, the next term is less than the current term. 
Um, and it's monotone if it's either one of those. If it's either increasing for all values past a certain point, or it's always decreasing. And here we have a theorem we are going to apply. If an is a bounded sequence, and there exists a, num a positive integer n naught, such that an is monotone for all n greater than or equal to n naught, then the sequence converges. If it is bounded, and there's a point at which it's monotone, then it converges. So let's dive into one of these. For each of the following sequences, use the monotone convergence theorem to show that the sequence converges, and then find the limit. For part A, we have 4 to the n, the sequence 4 to the n over n factorial. Now, to show that it is monotonic, that's the first thing we need to do to apply the monotone convergence theorem, we need to show that we have a monotonic, de monotonically decreasing or increasing, and then find a bound. If our, if our sequence is continually increasing, then we need to find an upper bound. If it's monotonically decreasing, we need to find a lower bound. So, we first need to determine what it is. And it looks like if we took a n plus 1, I'm going to try to relate the next term with the current term. That would be 4 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, which we can actually rewrite as 4 over n plus 1 times 4 to the n over n factorial. And if you notice, 4 to the n over n factorial is equal to a n. Which means that a n plus 1, just to sum that up here, is equal to 4 over n plus 1 times a n. Which means that the next term is always smaller because 4 to the n plus 1 is going, 4 over n plus 1 is going to 0. That tells us a n plus 1 is less than or equal to a n. And that is true if n is greater than or equal to 3, because at n equals 3, you have 4 over 4, which is 1. So they are equal at that point. And after 3, 4, that's 4 fifths. So it's, de it's getting smaller at that point. Okay, now, since we can notice that all of the terms of a n, that sequence, are greater than or equal to 0, 4 to any power bigger than 3. That has always been positive, and 3 factorial and anything larger than that is all bigger than 0. Since that sequence is greater than 0 for all n, okay, because that is true, we know that the monotone convergence theorem says that the sequence a n is convergent. Okay. Now, since it's convergent, we need to, to find the limit, we need to be a little creative. All right, now, what we can always say, we, this is always true, if something is convergent, then we know that the next term, okay, the limit of the sequence that's made up of a n plus 1, is going to be equal to the limit as you approach infinity for a sub n. That's true because their tails, if they're converging, the tail of that sequence, no matter where you start, it always goes to some value. Right? So, taking this fact, we know that a n plus 1 is equal to 4 over n plus 1 times a sub n. So we're going to replace this. 4 over n plus 1 times a sub n, and that is going to be just a sub n on that side. Now we can apply something, since we're going to go ahead and say that the limit is L, okay, let's make this a complete sentence. Now we know that those two limits are equal, and that implies this. Okay, the limit is n approaches infinity of 4 over n plus 1 times a sub n is equal to the original limit. Well, since we know that it does converge, we're going to just call this limit L. And say that is L, and this is going to be 0 times L. 
which means that L is in fact, if L equals L times zero, then our limit is zero. Therefore, okay, A sub N is converging to zero. Right. Once we can apply the monotone convergence theorem, that just tells us it's convergent, but we can therefore play around with some things because once we know it's convergent, to actually find the limit itself of that sequence. Right, part B, a n is defined by a sub 1 equals 2, and a sub n plus 1 is a n over 2 plus 1 over 2 a n. And I want to go ahead and use some algebra and so we can actually see something else here. If we got a common denominator here, okay, that would be a n squared plus 1 over 2 a n. Right, now, if we take some values, so say we start at 2, we plug 2 into this. Okay, we, that gives us our next value. If I plug in 2, that would be what? That would be 5 over 5 over 10. Okay, so 1 half. Now, if I plug 1 half into this, 1 half squared is 1 fourth, so that's 5 fourths over 1, so 5 fourths. I can start to, uh, this appears that it's going to be bounded. And let's try that again. 2 squared is 4, so that's 5. Oh, that denominator should be 4. OK, so that is 5 fourths. So let's try this one again. So if I take 5 fourths squared, that'd be 25 sixteenths plus 1. 25 sixteenths. This one is 41. Yes, okay. That's 41 sixteenths divided by 2 times that. That'd be 5 over 2. And let's see here. That'd be over 8. No, over 40. It'd be 41 over 40. And I've actually played with this previously, okay, so why these aren't coming to top, the top of my head. But it looks like they're actually, they actually will approach 1, or at least they're always greater than 1. And so it appears that they're bigger than 1. So what I want to go ahead and say is this. Okay, since this seems to be bounded below by 1, what I want to do is consider this. Let's consider a sub n squared plus 1 over 2a n being greater than or equal to 1. So I don't actually know that that's greater than 1, but I hope that it is. It seems like it is. So I'm going to play around with this. And if you do some algebra here, that would tell us that a sub n squared plus 1 is greater than or equal to 2 a sub n, which would tell us, let's see, let's rearrange that, a n squared minus 2 a n plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Again, these are just true statements. I'm going from what I hope is true, and I'm finding a true statement, hopefully. Now, this becomes a n minus 1 squared, and that is, in fact, always true because anything squared, as long as you're not zero, so as long as a n isn't exactly one, that should be true. All right, so we can trace that back, and that tells us, going in the reverse order, that since this is true, these are true, and that means this is true, so it is in fact bounded by, or bounded below by one. Now, because that fact is true, because that is true, and because a n squared is greater than or equal to 1, and that's, again, going back to that, that statement we just considered and we just showed to be true, since a n squared is greater than or equal to 1, that means that, let's see, we could rearrange this, dividing by, okay, so that means a n squared, okay, here we go, a n squared plus 1 is less than or equal to 
two a n squared. You might want to take a second to convince yourself of each one of these facts. Now, if we divide by two a n, on the right side, we have got a n, and on the left side. That is our a n plus one, that we, how we rewrote that. Which tells us that it is decreasing. Since it's decreasing and it's monotonic, sorry, that, that, that didn't make any sense. Since it's decreasing, which means it's monotonic, and because it's bounded below by one, the monotone convergence theorem tells that this sequence converges. Now to find the limit. We're going to appeal to the same facts from the last question. We know that the these two limits will be equal, which we know that the right side limit, we're going to call that L, and the left side is going to be, let's see, we have L over 2, plus 1 over 2L, and it's just applying to our a n plus 1. All right. And if we clear the fractions, we'll multiply both sides by 2L. We get L squared plus 1 equals 2L squared which means that L squared equals 1, which means L is plus or minus 1. Wait, how can we have two limits? Well, we don't. Because it's bounded below by 1, we know that it must be equal to 1. And there is our limit. You don't want the answer to that one. All right, part C. A n is defined by a equals 1, and a n equals a n minus 1 divided by 2. All right. So, if we start playing around, as I like to say, the first term is 1, the second term is 1 half, the third term is 1 fourth, because we're dividing by 2 each time, we need to determine what is going on with this. Let's see, we still have our same results. All right, so first, a n plus 1 is 1 half of a n. It's cutting in half by each time, which means, since that is less than or equal to a sub n, that is definitely, definitely decreasing. Okay, so since we are monotonic, we need to see if it's bounded. Well, again, if you notice this, this is actually equal to a sub n is 1 over 2 to the n, to the 2 to the n minus 1, actually, to adjust for that first term being 1. So if you evaluate that at 1, that would be 1 over 2 to 0, which is 1. Evaluating that at 2, that would be 1 half, etc. Right. So we know that a sub n is greater than or equal to 0. It approaches 0, but it doesn't quite get there. Well, since a sub n is equal to 1 over 2 to the n minus 1, we know that that approaches 0 just based on our limit properties. And there we are.